Today, we could be in Athens, in ancient Greece. We have the weather for it, and we have the architecture. I wonder if you know anything about this building, when it was constructed, what it was for. It might help us if we just go and have a look inside. The building we're looking inside today doesn't have an immediately obvious purpose. It's a plain, rectangular space, it doesn't have any windows. Is it a chapel? Well, there's no altar, no stained glass windows, no windows at all, as I say. It has beautiful, graceful, ionic columns, four down each side. And the walls, here's the clue to its purpose, the walls are lined with statues. The most beautiful one is directly behind me. And we're looking at a piece of work that was completed in Rome by a Roman sculptor, Pietro Tenerani. And its subject is one, Elizabeth Agnes Jones. Agnes Jones came to Liverpool as a nurse and was brought to Liverpool by William Rathbone to work in the Brownlow Hill Institute, the workhouse. She was the first nurse appointed to a workhouse and in the seven years that she worked there, she greatly improved living conditions for the residents. And by the time of her death, at the tender age of 35, she was leading a team of 50 nurses and probationers, greatly improving survival rates and conditions for people in the workhouse. The monument to her is called the Angel of the Resurrection. It's a beautiful piece of work. And at the bottom, underneath the statue, is an inscription by Florence Nightingale. This is one of several funerary statues inside this building. And the statues are all of people who were important, either in medicine or in achievements in the arts, in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. Funerary statues give a clue to the purpose of this beautiful, beautiful building. Today we're looking at a building which has been described as the most perfect monument in England to the Greek Revival. It's a beautiful little building, as you can see. It's made of stone, stone built with a decorated parapet. It has a stone roof. You might be able to just about see there's a space in that roof which is the only source of light when you're inside the building. There are no windows. And at the front and the rear, there are six Doric columns. It's a building that could stand, could have stood, above Athens as part of the Acropolis. And in fact, it's very much modelled on the buildings that you might get in Athens or in any of the Greek islands. It's a perfect replica of a small Greek temple. And here it is, standing above Liverpool. It was constructed in 1829 and opened on the 1st of January 1829. And the purpose it served was to be a chapel, a funerary chapel, for conducting funeral services. Services would be held in the chapel, and the chapel itself would have been accessed from the front, giving to anybody who was attending the funeral a backward look at a most magnificent city, not Athens, but Liverpool, at the height of its prosperity at the height of its greatness as the second port in the empire. So it's a building atop a hill, atop a city at its period of greatness. It's the oratory. So now we've come down into the churchyard, into the cemetery, beneath the oratory. But as you can see, it possibly hasn't always been a cemetery. And you're right. Down here, and we've come down quite a long way, was a quarry. This whole site was a quarry from which stone was excavated for the building of many of Liverpool's 18th century beautiful buildings, including the town hall. 
The quarry was uh, worked throughout the 18th century, but by the early 1800s, there was a great need for more cemetery space in the city. Small parish church churchyards were no longer adequate for the rapidly increasing population of Liverpool. Down here, the quarry was turned into a cemetery, the second public cemetery in the city. And on January the 1st, 1829, it opened as a cemetery. This really is the most stunning space, a stunning part of Liverpool, possibly not that well known. We've come down from the oratory, the oratory is up on its promontory above us, and we're down now at the base of what was the quarry. It's beautifully laid out with winding pathways, with trees, and at this time of the year, with snowdrops and daffodils, really is very lovely. Um, the architect, the designer of the space, of the oratory itself, and also the monument behind me was John Foster, who was the city surveyor, as his father had been, and he was also an architect for many, many fine buildings in the city. But what he made of this space here is really quite stunning. And he's included in his plan for the cemetery, catacombs dug into the old quarry face. Well, the catacombs are really extensive and all part of this truly wonderful site. The John Foster, who designed it all, the layout and these lovely pathways um, and the building behind me, um, was sent by his father, John Foster Senior, to study and travel widely in Greece. And he was away in Greece from 189 to 1816. He was travelling in the company of Charles Cockrell, great architect. Cockrell wasn't terribly impressed with Sir John Foster's application to architecture and rather criticised him, possibly in a bit of a joking way, for his wider interest in Greek culture, shall we say. But John Foster came back with many drawings of temples, all sorts of buildings that he'd seen and that he drew in great detail. Many of his drawings are in the Walker Art Gallery. He left his impact on this city as his father had done before him. He designed seven churches of which one remains close to where we are now, the facade of the St Andrew's Church in Rodney Street. But this site and its surrounding area, which we call Georgian Liverpool, but in part of it, this site is John Foster's greatest achievement. The oratory where we started, this lovely cemetery where we are now, and this little gem of a building that's behind me, which we'll look at in a moment. John Foster was city surveyor, corporation surveyor, for many years, and he's certainly left his mark on our city. Standing right in the middle of this beautiful space, this lovely garden, is the circular temple with the domed roof you can see behind me. It is based on the Karadzic monument to Lysikrates near the Acropolis in Athens. It was completed in 1834 and it was designed by John Foster, who else? It was built to house a statue to William Huskisson. William Huskisson, MP of Liverpool, has a street named after him nearby who is buried very close to where I'm standing and who died tragically at the opening of the first passenger service on the railways in the world, the Liverpool to Manchester Railway, where he was dragged under the train at the opening ceremony. But now, of course, these beautiful gardens, this monument, this whole space is dominated by the building that stands behind me and looks down on all of it. In 1827, at the laying of the foundation stone for the oratory, the rector of Liverpool, Reverend Jonathan Brooks, said, soon there will arise 
on this spot a perfect example of classical Greek architecture. He went on to say that it will be a tribute both to the city and age of its creation and also to its architect. He didn't know, of course, that on the adjacent spot another great building would also arise. Some 140 years later it would be completed. Everybody knows that Liverpool has two cathedrals. What we have here on these spots are two adjacent Grade 1 listed buildings. We have the tremendous Anglican Cathedral, the largest Anglican Cathedral in the world, considered to be the best example of 20th century neo-Gothic architecture and the finest work, the life's work, of Giles Gilbert Scott. And we have here the building we've been looking at, this perfect example of the Greek Revival, one standing on its own for some hundred or more years it stood here, dominating this spot, looking down on its city, just like an original Greek temple above Athens standing in the Parthenon. This is John Foster's finest work, the oratory. I'm Jen, your RIBA guide. We're going to visit St Nick's, or the Sailors' Church, or to give it its full name, the Church of Our Lady and St Nicholas, the Parish Church of Liverpool. Our Lady refers to St Mary's of the Quay, which was on the, built on the site as long ago as 1257. And it was the church that gave Chapel Street its name. St Nicholas's church was built on the site in 1355. Now, if we go back in time to the 1700s, stood here, I'd be getting my feet wet because the tide came right up to the walls of the church. And in 1715, Liverpool built the world's first wet commercial dock, the old dock, and from there trade just took off and more and more docks were built. You can see from this map of the late 1700s, here's St Nicholas's Church, and all this is reclaimed land. So let's go and have a closer look at the church. Now nothing remains of the church that was built in the 1350s. And the oldest part of the church is this Gothic tower and splendid steeple. That was built in 1815 and it was designed by Thomas Harrison of Chester. It replaced the steeple and tower that collapsed in 1810 on a congregation killing 25 members, 21 of whom were from the local charity school. The the nave of the church was bombed during the war on the 20th of December 1940 and all that remained of the church was the tower and the steeple. The present church, the nave, was built in 1953 to a design by Edward Butler. It's a simple Gothic building no buttresses, the windows are perpendicular in style. The old church followed the tradition of lying the nave east to west so that the altar was at the east of the church to welcome the rising sun. This new church has turned the orientation on its head 
so that the altar now lies to the west of the church. Now, the brief for the building was to make the inside of the church as light and spacious as possible. So let's see if that's been achieved. The church is open and light. The roof is open, exposing the timber beams. The organ and the choir are at the back of the church to give the congregation a clear view of the altar. Even the floor has been raked slightly so that the congregation look down onto the altar. There's no screen separating the nave from the sanctuary. And even the pulpit and the lectern have been replaced by reading desks to give more space. There's only one stained glass window and that represents post-war hopes for the future, for the healing of nations. Notice St. Nicholas in the right-hand corner holding a ship up to Mary who's sitting on the throne. The other windows are plain glass. They have a border of fragments of the stained glass from the old bomb church. There are two chapels, one either side of the sanctuary, and this is St. Peter's Chapel. The altar came from St. Peter's Church in Church Street that was demolished in 1922. On that night in December 1940, the rector of the church made this makeshift cross from the charred timbers of the bomb church. This is the Maritime Museum and here we have a sculpture by Arthur Dooley. It's St Mary of the Quay and she's looking down serenely from the prow of a ship. Now many locals or visitors to Liverpool may have a photograph of another of Arthur Dooley's sculptures and that's John Lennon in Matthew Street. The plaque says about the graveyard being donated as a garden in remembrance of James Harrison. Well, who is this James Harrison? Well, James and Thomas Harrison founded the T and J shipping line, Harrison shipping line. And in 1891, they had this building built, the Mersey Chambers for their offices. It was designed by G.E. Grayson. Notice the maritime theme with the sailing ship and the liver bird. So let's go and have a look and see from up there. It's difficult to imagine that when the tide was in, it would come up to the wall of the churchyard and all the land from the churchyard wall to the river is reclaimed land. In 1361, when plague struck the town, the churchyard was used as a graveyard and it was used for burials up until 1849. Today it's a green oasis in the heart of the city business centre and on sunny days it's popular with office staff and visitors who come to the garden to relax and unwind. Why did Liverpool take such a battering during the Second World War? Well, Liverpool played a pivotal role in the war because of its strategic position, with millions of tons of supplies coming through the port. And as a consequence, we were a target for airstrikes. 
and many civilians from Liverpool and Bootle lost their lives in the Blitz during from the August 1940 to May 1941. And this, the Liverpool Blitz Memorial is in remembrance of those victims. It's by Tom Murphy. The mother is clutching her baby as she reaches anxiously to her son, trying to coax him down the steps. He's distracted playing with his aeroplane, which can be seen as an instrument of destruction or as a cross in remembrance of those that died. St. Nicholas once took a prominent position on the waterfront, but in the late 1800s, George's dock was filled in and the Three Graces were built. So now the Liver building dwarfs the church and more recently, the Unity building. However, it's surprising how the delicate lantern can be spotted, standing proudly amongst these overbearing buildings. Thank you.